Tell me about the Children's Gate. Children's Gate is a real place and you really can't go through it. It's the entrance to Central Park on the east side of the park at 76th Street in Manhattan, obviously. And it was called the Children's Gate by Frederick Law Olmsted, the great uh, landscape architect who designed Central Park, because he gave names to each of the entrances to the park, the Miner's Gate, the Scholar's Gate, the Engineer's Gate, the Stranger's Gate. And he decided to call one the Children's Gate, because that was where children presumably would come in. It was a kind of larksome idea. So it's a real place, and there's a real playground there, so kids go through it all day long. But obviously it also came to have a certain kind of symbolic resonance for me. It meant the way you entered, going through the Children's Gate, was coming into New York, coming home to New York, um, with a couple of children, with the knowledge that your primary duty or responsibility and pleasure was raising a family. So to go through the Children's Gate actually means just going into the park at 76th Street, but it also for me means re-entering life as a parent. Are your kids still talking to you? Because they're in here an awful lot. A version of them is in here an yeah. awful lot. They're, they're not really in, in an awful lot. I mean, of course they are, and all the things I tell are true things. But they're tiny, kind of little stylized chunks of their life. For instance, my daughter Olivia, in, in, in a piece that was, that was sort of well-known before I put it in the book, bumping into Charlie Ravioli, had this imaginary friend, Charlie Ravioli, who's always too busy to play with her. And it was sort of a perfect New York story. It was Ravioli, he would, you know, she would call him on her cell phone, and then on her imaginary play cell phone, she doesn't have a real one, and say, you know, can you call me when you get in? And she would cl close and say, I always get his machine. Because she was growing up in a, in a world in New York where that's all she heard all day coming from the parents. I bumped into someone, I missed them, I left a message, and so on. And of course, it was all true. She really, Charlie Ravioli was her real imaginary friend, or if, if there's such a thing. But it was a tiny chunk of her life. In other words, Ravioli plays a major role in my imagination, but it played only a passing and transient role in her imagination. And I would never write anything about the children that was, I thought, genuinely private to them. Something that was, you know, they, like all children, have anxieties, fears, phobias, insecurities that are their own, and I, I wouldn't write about, in fact. I absolutely adored Charlie Ravioli. I thought that was wonderful. And then, because it goes another step even beyond that, because she, what's Charlie Ravioli's secretary? Yeah, Charlie Ravioli's secretary, Lori, who um, uh, uh, we, we figured out finally, is, so Olivia finally was talking to Lori, Ravioli's assistant, um, who was always, would tell her that he, he was too busy to play with her. Uh, and it got, it got wild. Because, you know, she, like all children, children are these amazing antennae. They just hear and notice everything that's going on in the world around them. You can't, one of the things I've realized, and one of the things I try to write about, is you can't conceal anything from children. You can't conceal your doubts or anxieties or insecurities um, from them. And they notice everything. They notice the way you speak on the phone. They notice the way you interact with your friends and with your boss. Um, and finally, all you say, and that's sort of the other little um, uh, little bell that rings to the book, is trust me. And you're always, when they're, when they're anxious or uncertain in the face of all the difficulties of life, you say, just trust me. And they know that that means not I'm right and I've been there, but I'm a few steps ahead of you in this game. I'm just a, just a few steps, but enough steps ahead of you that you can trust me that this particular horrible thing isn't likely to happen. And of course, the parent knows inside that he's only a few steps ahead and that you can't guarantee anything. Tell me about the mafia game, because that, that, that was a... That's a weird... I love that. That was so cool. It's a weird thing. There's a parlor game which apparently began either in Russia or at MIT. You read different things. If you go online and try I always out. get those two confused. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know actually where it began, but it's a very strange parlor game that swept through sort of writer's circles in New York a couple of years ago. And it involves, it would take me forever to try and explain the rules, but basically um, there, you get about 15 people together. Uh, Twelve of them are villagers, and three of them are secretly mafia. And by a show of hands, the villagers try and kill who they think is mafia. And then at night, so to speak, when everybody shuts their eyes, the mafia people secretly kill the villagers they think are onto them. So it's a sort of competition and in, in, in murder. And what's interesting about it is that you, what the game really is about is if spotting when people are lying. So there's just conversation. The only clues you have about whether someone is in the mafia or not is the way they try to explain that they're not in the mafia. Because each person has to say, oh, I'm not mafia. And so it's a way of trying to read other people's um, faces, sort of like Blink, like my friend Malcolm Gladwell's book. It's about learning to read those clues. And what's so funny about it is, is that husbands and wives, in my experience, can read each other instantly. Husbands and wives know in a second, in less than a second, if the other one is lying. But nobody ever believes them. Nobody, if you say, I know she's lying. I, I, she's in the mafia. I can tell. She says she's not. I know her so well. 
people don't credit husbands and wives' insights into each other because they sort of discount it from the beginning. They figure that, well, if he could really see right through her, he never would have married her in the first place. So you have this funny double game where you're saying, yes, I know. I always know when she's lying and no one believes it. So, and then the other strange thing about it was is that you become aware slowly over time that the real game of mafia is who gets invited back to play again, that that's the real game of social exclusion, not real murder, but um, symbolic murder that's being played in those circles. Makes me want to go to New York. I mean, I, I finished the book and went, boy, I haven't been in New York in a while. It's time to go back again. Welcome. Come. It, that, that would be great. The book is Through the Children's Gate, A Home in New York. I've been speaking with the author Adam Gopnik and Through the Children's Gate, published by Knopf Canada.